My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Maedin Television. Well, thank you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maedin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing a country that's no longer there, Yugoslavia. What role did NATO play in the bombardment of Yugoslavia and in the ending of a unitary Serbian state in the birth of what at least part of the world calls Kosovo. Supporters of NATO describe it as a defensive organization, though the Libyan people might have something to say about that. And so, of course, do the people in Serbia. A defensive organization that got involved in a civil conflict in a country that had already begun to break up and, in fact, facilitated the illegal, unconstitutional transfer of a significant part of Serbia into some kind of, I don't know, purgatory, neither one thing nor the other, neither a state, at least not one recognized by the United Nations and much of the world, but recognized by all the familiar countries of the world. The ones who say that Crimea cannot have self-determination insist that Kosovo can. I've already made clear where I stand. I was one of the leading figures in the opposition in the British Parliament to NATO's role in the Yugoslav war. Uh, under the leadership of the late Mr. Ben, there were only a dozen of us, but that can be a magic number. The uh, role that NATO has played in recent conflicts has been so deleterious, we believe, that we formed no to NATO in London just the other month. It's growing like topsy. Many people are questioning now whether NATO is a good idea and whether its role in particular in the breakup of Yugoslavia was something worth supporting. President Clinton is, of course, no more. The Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who was the joint architect of NATO's intervention in Yugoslavia, is still very much with us. Indeed, he's considerably richer than he was back then. But these are only my personal views. This is called Kali Mahorra for a reason. Everyone has a free word here, and I'm just the enthusiastic amateur. I'm joined, unusually, by a particularly expert panel uh, of authoritative people, academics of the highest rank, which doesn't mean they're going to be right, of course. We'll soon find out. Let's meet the first of those. Dr. Aidan Heher is a reader in international relations at the University of Westminster. He's the author of several books, including Most Apocite, Kosovo, Intervention and State Building back in 2010. Uh, Dr. Aidan, uh, tell us where I was wrong in my introduction there to this topic. Uh, hard to know where to begin. There's a lot there that I would, I would disagree with. I, I, I don't think that NATO had a plan from the beginning to um, destroy Yugoslavia. I think it, uh, its policies were very piecemeal, made on the hoof, and uh, often they made mistakes. Um, I don't think that NATO has ever presented itself as being a disinterested, charitable organisation. So it's a defensive alliance. Yeah, but it, it, it has its own interests, clearly. And in Yugoslavia, at various different times, it had its interests and it pursued them. 
and sometimes I think the, uh, the net effect of that was negative. I would say in the case of Kosovo that it had a, a very positive effect and um, as much as I would present myself as somebody who would be uh, highly critical of NATO, I wouldn't ever support um, uh, unquestionably, uh, unquestioningly US foreign policy or UK foreign policy, but in this specific case, I think the benefits of the intervention outweigh the negatives. What would you say to those that say there's a highly selective uh, approach to uh, issues like Kosovo, for example, the, the Catalan uh, question, who did make uh, an effort to declare themselves independent from Spain, were crushed quite forcibly by the Spanish state with the full backing of the European Union? or perhaps more contemporarily, uh, the, the territory of uh, Crimea. Uh, why must that remain in a hostile Ukrainian state, but Kosovo must be allowed to be independent of an arguably hostile Serbian state? Mm. I mean, I remember being in, in uh, uh, Switzerland in 1999 and there was lots of protests at the time um, by Kurds about what was happening in, in Turkey. And the response of NATO to what was happening in Turkey with respect to the Kurds differs significantly to what was happening with respect to the Kosovo Albanians. So if the charge is that NATO has been inconsistent, then I agree. Absolutely. Well, inconsistent is a nice way of putting it. Hypocritical, double standards. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, stronger way. Standards. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I don't, I'm not aware of any state in the world that pursues a purely ethical foreign policy. Just before I leave you then, uh, what was the interest uh, of NATO in facilitating further breakup of Yugoslavia? I think there was a combination of factors. One of the bigger ones was that um, NATO wanted to expand. There was a sense that Eastern European countries were, were questioning why would we join this organisation if it's not working, if it's moribund, if it can't deal with this crisis in Kosovo. Um, and there was a sense that we need to project power into Eastern Europe to demonstrate that we still have a purpose. I also think that there was a, a, an economic rationale. Clinton said that at the time as well, that if we don't, if we want to have a trade relationship with Europe, we can't have conflict on the borders of the EU, we need to deal with that. So there was very obviously self-interested motivations. But there was also a sense, I believe, among some people involved, that this couldn't be allowed to stand, that we had naked aggression being visited upon um, the Kosovo Albanians by the the Serbian state, that Milosevic had demonstrated previously that he was um, intent on ridding Kosovo of the uh, Albanian community, and that there was a strong moral case to be made there. It certainly wasn't the exclusive reason for intervening, but a degree of mixed motivation is, is inevitable in international relations. Uh, Dr. Niall McRae, officer of the Workers of England Trade Union, former lecturer at King's College, uh, where did you stand and where do you stand now looking back at uh, what might be said to have been a prototype intervention by NATO? Uh, I certainly characterised it uh, at the time. Mr. Ben taught us that, that if they succeed in this intervention in Yugoslavia, there will be a number of other countries down the line waiting for the same kind of treatment. And of course, that came to pass in in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, uh, in uh, Syria, uh, weren't these all ineluctably flowing from the success, in inverted commas, of the NATO intervention in Yugoslavia? Well, I think balkanization was the purpose of NATO's intervention in Yugoslavia. I remember after the fall of communism, Francis Fukuyama talked about the end of history. And what I believe he really meant was the end of politics. From now on, a neoliberal new world order would prevail. And its first attack on nation state after the fall of communism, after Francis Fukuyama uh, made that comment, was on Yugoslavia. And what we now see is a continuing dispute over Kosovo, which is a small area on, on the southern side of Serbia. And I believe that Kosovo is being used, has been used since, since the war in the late 90s, as a sort of bargaining chip 
actually it's worse than a bargaining chip. It's like an ultimatum. It's an ultimatum to the Serbian government that either you join us with the European project, with, with the, the values of NATO and the West, or we will take Kosovo from you. And we won't stop there. And we know from what happened in the war in the late 90s, just how much the government in Belgrade um, was targeted. That country was destroyed by NATO. Perhaps Yugoslavia wouldn't have lasted anyway after the fall of communism. We don't know that, but it certainly wouldn't have ended in the way that it did, which was a carnage. NATO spent 78 days bombing Serbia. It wasn't just bombing the Zastava ammunition factory. It was bombing care homes, hospitals, the TV power stations, grid. stations, like TV this one. TV stations. Yeah. Chinese embassy. So you, you were primed for it, George, coming from your end of the political spectrum. Yugoslavia was the first time, for me coming from a more sort of conservative point of view, it's the first time I realized just how bad the West and NATO actually are. Uh, Dr. Jakob Azemi, journalist and postgraduate teaching assistant at the UCL in London, School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Dr. Aidan thought there was no plan. Dr. Nile thinks there was a plan. I also do. Where do you stand? Um, well, a lot of um, a lot to talk about about the, the way how you frame the, the question. But I think if you want to attack NATO's um, moral dimension, I think choosing um, to attack it over Kosovo is, is I think, a wrong framework. Uh, we, when we talk about NATO's involvement in NATO, we for, in Kosovo, we forget actually the history of Yugoslavia, of dissolution of la, last Yugoslavia, the political uh, balance that existed before Serbia uh, encroached on the autonomy of Kosovo, which was all but in name as a republic of former Yugoslavia, eight constitutive elements of federal Yugoslavia, on which Serbia embarked, removed its autonomy, and, and sort of destroyed the balance upon which the Yugoslav Federation rested. Following that, Albanians responded peacefully for 10 years. They organized a, a nonviolent movement trying avoiding to enter in a conflict which would have had catastrophic consequences for the whole region. The Western powers, the EU, the United States, Russia, you might review their approach to, towards the, the, the Yugoslav crisis, and you might then attack the West why not having intervened earlier in Bosnia and prevent the massacres of civilian population there. But when it came to the, to the Kosovo crisis, the Milosevic regime, Yugoslav Serbian regime, would not stop. Their ultimate aim was to wipe Kosovo from Albanians' substance. It is then the, when the West and the NATO decided enough was enough. Then you may, you may uh, decide to criticize NATO from, from uh, different perspectives, but as far as Kosovo is concerned, I think, I think it, it is one of the if we actually want to, to study politics from an ethical point of view, it is, it is there where you, you might find the ethics in, the, in, the, in international politics. It saved two million population. It, did, it caused damage. It, it bombarded 78 days in Serbia, but it, it was necessary. Necessary, I see. Uh, dear doctor, I was in Kosovo when almost nobody in Britain knew whether it was something you ate, drank, or drove. So I'm not in need of any lectures about Kosovo and Milosevic and Serbia. Uh, I'm a former president of the Great Britain Albania Society, in which capacity I was there in Pristina. But to say that, and I oppose the ending of the uh, status of Kosovo, within Serbia. But to say it was in everything but name a republic of Yugoslavia is simply untrue. 
I, I, it, it was. It, it was a province of Serbia, which was a constituent part can, of Yugoslavia. Can, can I take you on this? Yeah. In 1912 and 13, when the um, Balkanic Wars, with the, with the withdrawal of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire from, from the Balkan regions, uh, Kosovo was, was not part of Serbia. Serbia occupied Kosovo. And well, in terms of international legal instruments, Kosovo was at never... At exactly the same time, Kuwait Co was a part Co of Iraq. Kosovo... How many Walayats are we going to Mr. argue Galloway, about here? Uh, uh, if you allow me to. Kosovo was never incorporated within Serbia in terms of international legal instruments. For that to happen, the Assembly of Serbia and Assembly of Turkey at the time should have ratified an agreement for that to happen. That never happened. Kosovo was incorporated as part of Yugoslavia at the time, Kingdom of Yugoslavia, between, uh, among Serb Serbia, uh, Slovenia and, and, and Croatia, but never part of Serbia. Similarly, after the second, in the, during the Second World War, Kosovo was, was incorporated partly within Serbia, and then gradually was, um, uh, its status was um, advanced. Hence, in 1974, Kosovo became a constitutive element of the Yugoslav Federation, along with Vojvodina and six other republics. Serbia could not have changed its um, uh, constitution without the consent of Kosovo and Vojvodina. It did so without their consent, bullying them, with the military, with police and paramilitary forces, forcing Kosovo and in, including pushing different uh, entities to uh, occupy the parliament of Kosovo and change the, the acclamation, change the constitution of Kosovo. Following that, Albanians, as I just said, for 10 years responded peacefully, 10 years through a parallel- Was the KLA a peaceful organization? KLA was a you you cannot uh, you cannot qualify a an, a a military organization peaceful but KLA only uh, uh, appeared after the Dayton agreement which failed to incorporate Kosovo in its did it come from its, thin air the Kosovo Liberation Army Kosovo Liberation Army Who grew, grew 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 from from small small groups for for three from three four uh, individuals in Kosovo gradually grew in 1980 uh, 1997 98 it, it because at that time there was no, there's no, well, there was no other other way. But supported by the CIA, wasn't it? Uh, uh, rather uh, mysterious, the emergence from three or four people to uh, the organisation that later came to be. But let's get a view from Budapest, in Hungary, to talk to Professor George Samuli, who is a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute and author of, again, Aposite. Bombs for Peace, NATO's Humanitarian War in Yugoslavia. Uh, doc, uh, Professor George, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. George, why did NATO bomb Yugoslavia in 1999 and was that legitimate? I certainly don't think it was uh, legitimate. Um, I think NATO wanted to show its relevance. Um, you know, less than a decade had passed since the uh, dissolution of the Warsaw Pact and the emerging consensus within the Western world was that now that Warsaw Pact has dissolved, there was very little sense in uh, NATO to continuing to exist. And so NATO invented a, um, a idea for itself, which is the responsibility to protect. So it, it uh, manufactured a uh, pretext that it was uh, uh, stepping in with bombs in order to save the Kosovo Albanians from uh, the marauding Serbs. It was completely untrue. Uh, so that's one reason. The second reason I think is that NATO saw the Serbs as a uh, proxy for Russia. They wanted to eliminate Russian influence from Europe once and for all. You know, the Balkans, particularly the Serbs, had been very close to the Russians. And uh, they saw that this is one golden opportunity, essentially, to push Russia and Russian influence out once and for all. The UN Charter prohibits the uh, member states from attacking other member states without the endorsement of the Security Council. So why did they do it? Well, that's exactly right, that they, they knew that they would not be able to get uh, the United Nations Security Council to uh, approve of this bombing. Uh, 
and uh, and they made no effort, in fact, to go to the Security Council um, to get the mandate because they knew that Russia would, of course, veto it, as would uh, China. Um, and this was really the first of the numerous Western uh, military interventions that uh, came without any kind of a mandate from the UN Security Council. Why did the UN do nothing about the NATO action? Kofi Annan uh, danced around its legitimacy, legality, and the rest. And does it mean, did it mean from that day onwards, that NATO could strike uh, member states of the UN without the authority of the UN? Well, can they do it? Are they physically able to do it? Yes, because uh, the United States, United Kingdom, France, who are all signed up for this, they're all chartered members of NATO, they're all nuclear powers, and they can do it. And they can essentially uh, present uh, Russia, who is very opposed to this, uh, with a fait accompli and say to them, well, what are you going to do about it? We know Serbia is your friend. But there's nothing you can do because are you going to start a nuclear war for Serbia? And of course, Russia said, no, we're not. Um, but uh, going back to Kofi Annan, Kofi Annan was very um, evasive. He suggested that it was illegal, but it was legitimate. So he, so he, he kind of went very close to uh, the edge. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, yeah, because he ultimately had to say that you can't use force um, without some kind of an imprimatur from the Security Council. But he said, yeah, but it was legitimate because it had some humanitarian uh, goal behind it. It sounds like sophistry, but what was argued at the time was that the Charter forbids individual member states of the UN from attacking other member states. But NATO is not a state, although it could argue it's rapidly becoming one. No, uh, of course not. Um, NATO is supposed to be a military alliance. But the strange thing is that NATO has now acquired this nebulous uh, uh, continental entity whereby NATO is seems to be like a country. Uh, so you have um, uh, President Biden talking about, we are going to defend every inch of NATO territory. Well, since when did NATO have any kind of territory? NATO is supposed to be a military alliance. It doesn't have territory, but it's now acquired the standing that, well, NATO keeps expanding. And so this territory becomes NATO land, you know, some, a state run by NATO. But And in effect, something like that is emerging, which, of course, is a violation of the uh, NATO charter. What lessons should we draw from the NATO action in Yugoslavia in 1999? Well, the lesson that I would draw um, is that NATO um, should have dissolved at the end of the Cold War, that NATO, as it continues to exist and as it continues to expand, is a threat to world peace. It's a threat to every country in its neighborhood. And as long as NATO is in existence and as long as it will continue to expand and as it continues to expand it is going to come into conflict with more and more countries uh, what happened to yugoslavia was the first of nato's wars and which also came about as a result of uh, its will to expansion because they nato saw the serbs as you know, as i said close to russia not exactly friendly toward nato and therefore they had to be eliminated so uh my feeling is that there can be no peace, security, uh, and kind of a mutual cooperation among nations as long as NATO continues to exist. You know, the only thing that makes sense is to work out some kind of a security framework, so initially certainly in uh, Europe, Eurasia, that accommodates everybody's uh, security interests, not just the uh, you know, 30 countries that comprise NATO membership. Heated debate, and it'll get even hotter in the second half. Stay tuned.
You're watching Kalimahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, talking about a country long gone, Yugoslavia. Dr. Aidan, just before the break, our professor in Budapest uh, reminded us of the what we might call the Chicago Doctrine, developed by Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, uh, in which big powers uh, arrogated to themselves the right to protect other people. Uh, isn't that exactly what Russia is doing in Ukraine? No, no. Aren't they protecting not. the Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine? Look, the, the previous speaker alleged that it was to do with the responsibility to protect in 1999. That didn't even exist until 2001. It wasn't even no, it recognized. was theorized. It, it was, was theorized. It, the idea of humanitarian intervention goes back thousands of years. The responsibility to protect is an idea that came about two years after. No, that was merely theorizing. No, that was that was that was a, that was a, was in ninety nine. No, that it was a different theorized responsibility. Protect is not the same thing as humanitarian intervention. There are two distinct Tell things. Me the difference. The difference is humanitarian intervention is an action taken in response to atrocity crimes inside another state. The responsibility without protect, international without potentially authority. without uh, the consent of the Security Council or the consent of the host state. The responsibility to protect. Give me an example of that. Well, Kosovo in nineteen ninety nine. No, before that. Of a humanitarian intervention. When, wh who? invaded another country prior to the invasion of Yugoslavia on a humanitarian uh, mission without the authority of the Security Council? Well, Tanzania got involved in Uganda, uh, India got involved in East Pakistan, um, Cambodia intervened in Vietnam. You can go back previously, there's lots of examples of that happening, even in just the post, uh, in, uh, the post UN. Um, era, but it's it's. I, I really think it's important to come back to the, the basic facts here, and the facts of this aren't necessarily did NATO do something because it was purely impelled by moral reasons. If if that's your threshold for a humanitarian intervention, then that clearly didn't happen in 1999. I'm not dewy-eyed about Tony Blair's motivations or the the Chicago speech that he gave in April 1999. They have interests. NATO has interests. That's not a, a revelation. But to attribute the intervention in Kosovo to some master plan and to make out that because the people who intervened in Kosovo in 99 were relatively the same people who intervened in Iraq in 2003 means that 1999 has to be seen as absolutely the same project is ridiculous. The, the, the notion that NATO destroyed Yugoslavia, it, it's a complete fallacy. Yugoslavia was destroyed by Serbian nationalists. That's who destroyed Yugoslavia. Let me, let, let, let me give you an example of how there might have been a plan. Uh, in Bush House, probably a block of luxury flats now, but there used to be the BBC World Service. It had a radio station for every one of the constituent parts of Yugoslavia, beaming nationalist and separatist propaganda into those countries, paid for by the Foreign Office in Britain. That sounds like a plan to me. Okay, fine. So the, the UK is involved in projecting its interests overseas and is in supporting particular groups. Fine, but that doesn't mean that the group itself is fundamentally illegitimate. The Kosovo Liberation Army, as was mentioned, emerged after 1995, after the Dayton Accords, which was uh, uh, the imposition of an agreement on the former Yugoslavia by the West, which they hoped would end any further cessationism. For the Kosovo Albanians, that was a disaster. The idea that they had this plan to separate Kosovo and Serbia doesn't equate with 1995. After 1995, the West said, Milosevic is the, the, the hard man of the Balkans. We can deal with him. He's going to maintain stability. We want nothing to do with Kosovo. Right up until 1998. In 1998, Robert Gelbard, who was the US um, uh, ambassador to Yugoslavia, he described the Kosovo Liberation Army as a terrorist organization. So even at that point in 1998, the West's approach to what was the, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia at that point was, keep it as it is. We don't want any more cessationism and to hell with the Kosovo Albanians. Now, as Milosevic's policies uh, accelerated, that became untenable. But the notion that in 1991, somebody sat down in the bowels of the White House and said, let's dismember Yugoslavia, it's ridiculous. Well, it's is it, uh, now, uh, uh, a terrorist organization, the KLA, as quoted by, uh, became, we became its air force. Uh, how did that happen? How did the KLO, KLA go from three or four people to being a, described as a terrorist organization uh, 
and then become the beneficiary of the NATO Air Force. Well, this uh, neoliberal stroke, neocon uh, project of, of NATO and the EU is quite happy to use violent extremists for its cause. Um, I believe that the Kosovan Li uh, Liberation Army has got elements of fascism in the same way that the Azov Battalion does in, in Ukraine. But, th but the EU and NATO will use these groups. They will use them because they're violent, because they're extreme, because that is how they get the best result. That is what they believe. They believe people fear violence, which they do. People feared the Azov Battalion in Ukraine, just as the many Serbian people who live in Kosovo feared the Kosovo Liberation Army. Let's get a view from Belgrade. Dr. Helena, uh, welcome to you. Thank you for the invitation. Dr. Helena, in your uh, analysis of the role of propaganda in the events of 1999, what did you find? I basically found out that propaganda played a very important role in motivating violence against civilians, or at the very least, increasing support for regimes that were advocating uh, such violence. In the Yugoslav case in particular, we basically had a country that used to peacefully coexist for for decades that all of a sudden violently fell apart within, you know, basically 10 years. And the main role that I believe propaganda played is that it created these discourses of threat, which basically portrayed the other side as threatening, thereby justifying the violence that, that were committed by, by the various troops. Can you elaborate uh, more on the, the role of NATO or members of NATO in that propaganda campaign? Yeah, well, I think, you know, politically speaking, NATO has played a really important role in the region, right? Like we've basically seen, you know, NATO conduct an aerial campaign in the former Yugoslavia because of the violence that was that was happening in Kosovo during 1998, 1999. So clearly, politically speaking, NATO was really important back in the 90s. I would argue that even today, NATO continues to play a very important role in Kosovo. I think, you know, whenever we see a flare up in Kosovo, people are concerned, are we going to see another war in Kosovo? And every time someone asks me that question, I always tell them that because K-4 troops are there, we're not going to see a war. The fact that NATO troops are based in Kosovo plays a really important role in preventing escalation and also, you know, serving as a deterrent factor for both sides, Serb and Kosovo alike, not to over-escalate. So politically speaking, NATO is a really important factor in keeping and maintaining peace in the region. So in your findings, was there justification for NATO? taking the action it did in the absence of a Security Council resolution? Well, NATO was never going to get the United Nations Security Council mandate, right? Because both Russia and China were quite clear that any such intervention would be veto. And China and Russia, as the P5 members, basically do have the power to do so. So if NATO was to wait for the approval of the United Nations Security Council, the, the campaign would have never happened. Um, I think that is probably the first controversy surrounding that intervention, you know, that Technically speaking, it wasn't legal. Uh, there were some, you know, other controversies surrounding the, the, the intervention. For instance, in, in April 1999, NATO bombed the headquarters of the radio and television of Serbia, which is probably the first time in contemporary history that a media organization has been deemed a legitimate target, right? But NATO's justification was basically that some military infrastructure was based in this building, but also that propaganda by RTS was so harmful and so important in the process of encouraging violence that that basically made RTS a, a legitimate target. I think all of that um, means that, you know, the discourses surrounding NATO and Serbia are very, very, very negative. At the same time, however, if NATO didn't do anything, there is a real question as to what this region would have looked like and what kind of things would have happened. Go back to 1995, for example, in Srebrenica, when you know the, the appetite for intervening was not as high as it was in 1999. And we basically have a situation whereby the international community stood by and watched genocide happen in Srebrenica. So, you know, from the NATO, from NATO's point of view, back at the time, there was a serious concern that violence in Kosovo might escalate past the point of no return, and that it is much better to intervene and prevent such violence rather than sit back and do nothing, given that there was a clarity that United Nations Security Council approval was never really going to come through. It was a new departure uh, for NATO in 1999, attacking uh, 
member state of the United Nations, which had not attacked another member state. Uh, it was a sign of things to come, wasn't it? Well, I, I definitely think that, you know, humanitarian interventions are a thing. We have seen humanitarian interventions in the past. And, you know, I, I do think that whenever there is a substantial concern that if nothing is done, serious violence against civilians will occur, we can potentially expect to have um, a humanitarian intervention. I mean, you know, if we ever do see a NATO member country attacked, we can expect NATO to respond. In terms of all other cases, I think it's going to be a case to case you know, decision making, whereby if there is a consensus among NATO member states, we can expect NATO to do something. But if such consensus cannot be reached, then potentially we're not going to see any any form of intervention. I think it's really going to be a case to case assessment as to what NATO does in these instances. You're a citizen of Serbia living in uh, Belgrade. What do people feel there now, uh, these years on? Are they happy about the NATO intervention or the opposite? Well, I really think that depends who do you ask. So if you ask people from Kosovo, I am sure that they are very happy and supportive of the fact that the intervention has happened. If you ask people from Serbia, um, and if you look at the data from the research that's been conducted on the issue in Serbia, um, people are people are very frustrated by that. For them, NATO intervention is unforgivable. Uh, people in Serbia feel that they have been attacked by a foreign international organization for no legitimate reasons. So yeah, it is a very polarizing thing. It really depends which ethnicity slash which country you live in. Basically, that's what's going to impact your opinion on NATO. If you live in a country or if you belong to the ethnicity that has been supported by NATO, then most surely you will be very supportive of the intervention. However, if you don't, then very clearly this intervention will be seen as an unforgivable act on, on behalf of NATO. So it really, it really depends. Uh, Dr. Jakob, Dr. Aden was aghast at my comparison uh, with uh, the plight of the people in the Donbass who for eight years were bombarded by the Kiev regime, 14,000 of them killed. Isn't the Russian intervention to protect them merely RTP, the right to protect? There is no enough evidence in my view that Ukrainians started to discriminate or attack people of Donbas. People of Donbas have suffered- The OSCE record, have suffered, you can read it. People of Donbas or Russian um, population in Ukraine have suffered as a, as a consequence of, of Russian uh, being Russian proxy within Ukraine and being being found in... Within but that's not... That's your opinion. I have another opinion. But the OSCE, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, has voluminous you, evidence you that talk, that is exactly you, what happened. You're talking about the same OSCE and the, and the same... Um, and the Council of Europe uh, uh, protagonist entities such as uh, Dick Marty, who were, who were uh, used by Serbian and Russian... Um, sort of propaganda to to pro produce these reports against KLA and Abolit. These. these are politicized. You're highly selective. Report. You're, You're highly selective. Re reports. This is all very highly selective. The OSCE is right here, but not there. The right to protect exists here, but not there. Isn't this the chaos of the so-called uh, rules-based international order, as opposed to international law as expressed through the Charter? of the United Nations. Let me, let me um, count, counter uh, pose you a question. Was that necessary for Russia to um, uh, invade Ukraine? Was that, did, did that give a, a legitimate uh, right for Russia to uh, invade Ukraine? Well, you say it gave NATO the right to invade Serbia. Donbass region and all these, they never had the status that Kosovo had. So it, again, Kosovo is in... Car, in, car, in if in the car, right to protect is a humanitarian one, that when, you, when civilians are being bombarded and killed, that a big power nearby, in the case of NATO, not so nearby, has the right to intervene to protect them. Why does that right exist for Kosovans, but not for the people of Eastern Ukraine? Then you would 
would r rightly ask a question, why don't we uh, empower the United Nations with the military power and, and choose where to intervene? Well, if my aunt had a beard, she'd be my uncle. The reality is that Russia has intervened in Eastern Ukraine to protect the people of Eastern Ukraine from eight years of bombardment. You condemn it and yet commend the NATO intervention against Serbia on exactly the same grounds you're rejecting but, in Ukraine. But Mr. Galloway, it did, the, the, the conflict in Donbas didn't start. It, it started in 2014 for different, completely different reasons. I'm not talking about the reason, I'm talking about the effect. The, 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 the what effect? About the cause, what about the effect? Um, it's, it's, sorry, I mean, I have to Aiden. say, there is no way you can draw a comparison. No, I know that you I'm, don't want to. No, it's, I'm it's asking you intellectually. Objectively, to, there's to, no way. You, you present them as analogous. They're absolutely not in any way analogous. Do, Ukraine do, is a do sovereign, listen, do Ukraine is a sovereign state. Russia is a sovereign state. Russia annexes Crimea in 2014 and invades eastern Ukraine. And in the process of that conflict, Ukraine responds, Russia responds, and there is a conflict in that particular region. The, the nature of that conflict is completely different to state-sponsored oppression that the Serbian forces uh, initiated without any justification in Kosovo from 1989 onwards. When Milosevic rescinds Kosovo's autonomous province status, uh, completely against the constitution of Yugoslavia, he initiates this whole process. The people of Kosovo then try to peacefully resist Serbian oppression and are eventually brought to, to, to the, the, the horrible conundrum where they have to take up arms against the Serbs. That is a completely different situation to Russia invading Crimea in 2014. I, I wish you would take a walk uh, through the uh, areas that have been bombarded for eight years by the regime in Kiev and explain to the parents of the children lost there that their children were children of a lesser God, that they did not meet your test of RTP, but the children of Kosovo did. It's a remarkable double standard. It isn't at all. It isn't at all. Obviously, any, any death is a tragedy, and I have nothing but sympathy for people who've been caught up in, in, in this particular war. But they have when no you, right to protection. When you look at who caused the conflict in well, Eastern Ukraine, it is Russia. Even if that conflict. was true, which it isn't, even if that was true, are the children of a lesser god of course in the not. Donbass? Of course they're not. So who's going to protect them? Who caused that problem? Never mind Where who caused it. It's Ukrainians that were killing them with NATO weapons, the same NATO I don't, that I, you're supporting I, in Yugoslavia. No, I'm not denying that there has been crimes committed by Ukrainian forces against innocent Russians. That's not something that we're going to disagree about. Your, the point that I do disagree about is that you're suggesting that the situation in Kosovo in 1999 is the same as the situation that yeah, Russia faced. I can see why you're uncomfortable with it. Dr. Nile, uh, the long and the short of it is that it was a success. Kosovo is now effectively an independent state, recognized by all but two, I think, of the members of NATO. Uh, not recognized by the majority of the world, but then that's the world we've got now. There's an us and them. Uh, it uh, destroyed uh, Yugoslavia, which ceased to exist shortly afterwards, the final breakup between Serbia and Montenegro, leaving Serbia alone. And now uh, the government in Belgrade is being strong-armed into accepting and recognizing what is effectively a NATO protectorate in uh, Kosovo. I'm arguing that in every one of those particulars, this was a template of what came later. Mm. As we predicted at the time that it would be, the success of the NATO operation in Yugoslavia directly led to the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and the attempt in Syria. Am I wrong or right? Well, I think it's interesting that there's been a lot of talk comparing Kosovo with the Donbass and the double standards that, that appear because uh, the professor on the Danube who spoke to us earlier, he, his argument was that the Serbians were used as a proxy for the Russians. There's a deep 
hatred of Russia in the neoliberal, neocon establishment that has been uh, for decades. It, it, didn't, it didn't go, it didn't go away with the fall of communism. In fact, arguably, it's got worse over the last 20 years or so. But I have a very interesting point that he made because it shows that we're actually talking about the same thing. This is not about humanitarian ethics. This is an attack on people that won't go along with the Western way, that won't go along with NATO. And if you listen to the ordinary Serbian people, they're at odds with the globalist infused government and institutions in Belgrade, which the likes of the Tony Blair Institute have been promoting. The ordinary Serbian people, I'm sure they, they want peace for themselves and the Kosovans and for their other neighbors, but they have strong bonds with Russia. They revere what Viktor Orban is doing in Hungary fighting back against the imposition of these supposedly progressive liberal values of the West and NATO, but actually their totalitarian values. Serbian people should be able to live as they want to live, just as the people in the Donbass should be able to live the way they want to live, and the Hungarian people should be able to live the way they want to live. There is a growing gap between the governments of these countries across Europe and the ordinary people. And uh, I'll tell you what, George, you, you're picking this up with your no to NATO organization that you're involved in, is that there's a growing resentment of this war being fought, not in my name, not in your name, and not in an increasing number of people in this country's name. If you think Tony Blair acted out of humanitarian motives in Yugoslavia or anywhere in his miserable life, I've got a bridge here in London I could sell you going cheap. I've been George Galloway. This has been Callum Ahura. Thanks for watching.